Hello, Jacob. We could do with some good news. So what can you tell us? Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to report that my team has successfully taken five antibodies that back in 2002 were determined to bind and neutralize, so block and, and stop the SARS virus. And we've evolved them in our laboratory, so now they very, very vigorously block and stop the uh, COV2 virus as well. So this makes them suitable medicines that one could use once they've gone through human testing to treat the virus. So you have confirmed already that these antibodies that you've isolated work against COVID-19. In what way? So the way we've confirmed it is we've taken these old antibodies. We know exactly where they bind on the virus and they know they block SARS. The new virus is a cousin of the old SARS. So what we've done is we've created hundreds of millions of versions of those antibodies where we've mutated them a bit. And in that pool of mutated versions, we found versions that cross them over. So now we know that they blo they bind on the same spot of the, not the new virus, the COVID-19 virus, and it, blo it binds the spot that the virus uses to gain entry into your cell, so it blocks that. At this point, we know it binds the same spot extremely uh, tightly with high affinity. And the next step is we send the, the antibodies to the military and they will directly put those on the virus and show that it blocks its ability to infect cells. So you don't do that. Why does the military do that? Because we don't want to have COVID-19 in our laboratory and we do not want to have SARS in our laboratory. The other th nice thing about it is you want the stamp of approval of a governmental military to independently test your work. This is one of the foundations of good science. So do you think you're the first ones to, to find these antibodies? No, there's a couple of good groups that are working on, on this. So there's you know three types of medicine, vaccines, uh, pills that are being repurposed or antibodies. Uh, antibodies are attractive because you can give them to a patient uh, right when they're in the hospital, like an antiviral. Um, that you can also give them to doctors, you could give them to the elderly people to prevent them from getting sick. So there are a couple other groups working on it. We're, part of the reason we think we're moving pretty fast is that instead of starting from scratch, discovering an antibody, we went to these existing antibodies that were already extremely well characterized against SARS and we've adapted them. So we're piggybacking on two years of research. So can you just explain to people in simple terms how this would be used? So it, would you need to be infected in order for it to assist you in any way? Or would you take it sort of like a short-term vaccine? Yeah, it's sort of like a short-term vaccine, except it works immediately. A vaccine takes, it could take six to eight weeks to take effect, where this is going to take, take effect within 20 minutes. Uh, you could either give it to a patient who's sick, who is experiencing COVID-19, and then Within 20 minutes of receiving the shot, their body's flooded with those antibodies. Those antibodies will go surround and stick all over a virus and make it so it's no longer infectious. You could also give it to, uh, let's say, a doctor or a nurse or an, an elderly person, and they would then have those antibodies in them, and that would protect them from getting infected in the first place. The, and the, how long would that last for, Jacob? Yeah, so that's the disadvantage compared to a vaccine. A vaccine might give you a year or multiple years of protection. This is going to give you more like eight to 10 weeks of protection. Eventually, those antibodies deteriorate and you need to get another shot. OK, so it goes off to the military, the work that you have done so far, and it gets tested. How long potentially does that take? And what is the next step? Is the next step testing it with human subjects? That's right. Yeah. So the there's a couple steps. The testing for neutralization, so testing it with virus, that's actually pretty quick. Uh, the other thing that we do is we send the samples to a laboratory, a Charles River Laboratories, and they're going to do safety and tox. They're going to do a series of tests to make sure that the medicine looks safe on human tissue samples, everything you can do before actually giving it to a person to say that this looks clean and safe to give to people. You also have to scale up production. Um, we use very exacting um, manufacturing standards called GMP for making a medicine, and that can take multiple months. Once, once that material is ready, we go into a human trial, and that's a phase one slash two trial where you give it to a series of 400 to 600 people who are in hospitals experiencing symptoms, and then you watch over the next five to 10 days to see whether it helped or not. Is there any way of safely speeding that process up? We are doing everything we can to speed this process up. I'll tell you the things we've already done, but I'll also just be sobering that this does take time. Uh, we, we have saved potentially years of research by piggybacking on the, the SARS antibodies, and our technology is very good at engineering these things to cross, and we've succeeded in doing that. The next step, the big time-consuming part, is the GMP manufacture. Traditionally, that takes nine to 12 months. Obviously, we can't wait that long, so we've worked with two different partners to try to accelerate that to take a few months, but that does take time, and there's really no way around and you kind of want these checks and balances to make sure the material you're producing is sufficiently high quality that it's safe to put into a person. Um, once that, that's in place, 
you have to run a phase one slash two study. And that's that's checking to make sure that it's safe in a person that doesn't cause any harm to people who receive it. And second, that it's effective, that it's actually a useful medicine. And so those experiments do need to be conducted. So let's assume for a minute that all goes swimmingly well, right? So what is the earliest possible time we might expect this to be available to use? So assuming that we're able to complete our study at the end of summer, the phase one slash two, and it looks good, then we would use something called compassionate use. And this is a, a it was used in the Ebola crisis, and it's been used in other cases where if you have something that's effective and there's no other good medicine, you can begin releasing it to the world for use prior to going through all the approval process. That, that could be as early as September. Unfortunately, that's also as far away as September. And so that, that's as fast as we can conceive of having this medicine widely available. So... What happens once you go through that? Who owns this? And will we in New Zealand get access to it or who gets it first? Yeah, so the idea is it's essential for us that everyone gains access to it. So we, as we set up the phase one slash two study in the United States, we're also creating a war room to have conversations with the European Commission, with interests in Asia, and we'd need to talk with New Zealand as well and make sure that the studies that are being conducted are minimum but sufficient for every nation to be able to receive the medicine. There's also considerations on them. We need to produce enough for about 600 doses for the phase one slash two. But my feeling is that we should also, in anticipation that that study looks good, and antibodies usually work well for this kind of purpose, we should start scaling up uh, a lot more doses, hundreds of thousands to millions for the next step. And governments should pay for that. They should be willing to bite the bullet and say the cost of all of our lives and the economy is so much greater than the additional cost of scaling up in anticipation that that medicine works, that they should sponsor that work. What do you think the cost of that is? Well, it's, you know, trillions of dollars to the annual economy, and then there's our lives, which are priceless. So I want to ask you a few other questions. As a pandemic expert, we here in New Zealand right now are in lockdown. Only essential workers are supposed to be allowed out. You're supposed to stay in your bubble, as we call it here, your family unit at home. Is this effective in terms of eliminating the virus, or is it only effective as long as we stay in lockdown? Okay, so here I've got some interesting and hopefully some good news. In particular, uh, New Zealand has an advantage as you know, a two island nation. Um, you have you have a moat, and that is helpful. So, uh, what happens when you do lockdown or uh, shelter from place, which is the same thing that they they instituted here in California, is you're asking everyone to go back to their homes. And when you're doing that, you're turning every home into a little little uh, quarantine. And so you can imagine it's almost like sending out a thousand ships and they're all not quite touching each other. And the, the advantage of this is imagine there's four people in every home. People go there. If they're not infected, those people are protected from getting infected. They're, they're contacting less people. If someone is in the house infected, they could infect up to four other people. But at that point, uh, they all start getting better. And then once you get better, most people are going to get immunity. So they won't get affected again. And that means that if you have everyone stuck in their homes, you're slowing the spread. Most of the cases resolve. And then when you release people back out, there's way less active cases, which means the new sets of cases are, are slowed. Uh, so, it's, you, so, Jacob, we're getting a little bit of herd immunity in a controlled environment as well as stopping the spread. Yeah, you have what happens when everyone goes leaves their homes again and you can resume normal life, you have a lot less active cases because the most of the cases have burnt out. Unfortunately, people don't follow rules well, so you're never going to get 100% blockage, but you can slow things down. And in particular, because... Uh, New Zealand doesn't have that many active cases yet. Um, rapid isolation of this class, followed by um, very aggressive uh, testing when you reintroduce everyone back out of their homes, could be a method to help really suppress the outbreak. And that, that is really a strategy that is, given how infectious this is, is probably the most effective strategy for most nations, is try to suppress it as much as possible and just d mitigate the 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 growth of infections until a decent medicine pops up. So obviously we're really deeply concerned about community transmission here in New Zealand at the moment and tracking cases. Should um, countries do random testing of general populations in order to locate community transmissions that they would otherwise not know about? Well, Korea, South Korea did that and it was very effective. It depends a little bit on your capacity for high throughput testing. If high throughput testing was unconstrained, they should treat it like the census and they should go out to every home when everyone's sheltering in place and they should determine which homes are infected and which are not. They in fact should do another test that you're not hearing about a lot and that is a, ser a serology test to see the people who have immunity and they are no longer at risk. But they're not running that one yet because there aren't that many people infected. Um, but but not every nation has enough tests to do that. So in the United States, as an example, we don't have the luxury of being able to test everyone. So those tests are being restricted more towards medical staff um, to protect them. And also you don't want medical staff who are sick in front of patients. 
uh, and then people that are showing strong symptoms. Uh, there's an inflection point. For New Zealand, it would make sense to more aggressively test because few people have it, and so therefore it's more valuable to identify a case and then isolate them, do contact tracing, which is a very effective technique that we've used to stop Ebola from ever becoming global. Tell me a little bit more about this um, test that checks your immunity. Yeah, so it's uh, it's the same test you could use. You go to the hospital routinely, and they try to see if you're up to, up to date on your booster shots or you've been infected. What they do is they take a little bit of your serum, uh, and then they go check to see if you have serum antibodies against a particular pathogen. So such tests uh, can be done for, for uh, COVID-19 as well. And what they do is they would tell you, even if a person never experienced symptoms, it would tell you whether that person likely was infected previously. This is actually the first test that's also done for like HIV, uh, a number of common, this is a common test. It looks like a, it can be set up to resemble a pregnancy test, a lateral flow test, and, and that could be done easily. The reason you don't see that so many of those out there yet is that we still have relatively few people who actually have uh, gone through the disease and developed immunity. But as more and more people are infected, that's going to be an important thing to know because the people who are protected, uh, they no longer need to worry about being sick. They could be safely working out in the food service industry or working with medical staff. And then they can just you know, help other people more once they've kind of passed to the other side of the the danger of COVID-19. So I'm just wondering how realistic, there's discussion about this in New Zealand today, how realistic is it to aim for complete elimination in a country of our size, do you think? It's extremely difficult to contemplate doing that because this virus is very infectious. It can have a long incubation period, like 14 days or more inside some individuals who are infectious while they're not showing symptoms. And there's a proportion of the population that that are not symptomatic. And so, and then, and even in, in those individuals, there's also a problem where they seem like they don't have that much virus reliably in their nostrils. So when you do these viremia tests, they sometimes show up negative for someone who later showed to be positive. All of those things together make it a bit of a Trojan horse where it's hiding out within people. I think you can mitigate, you can suppress, you can limit the spread, and you can case isolate. But uh, in absence of, of doing like census-like testing of every single home and not letting anyone in or out of the country, it's difficult to contemplate completely um, stopping the virus from popping up over and over again. Well, it's funny that you raise that because I'm also interested in your thoughts on border control. So at the moment, we're practically in complete lockdown here in terms of international tourists. We're letting our own citizens come back and, and permanent residents. If we wanted to ring fence ourselves, would we, in essence, have to keep a closed border until we get antibodies from you or a vaccine from somebody else? Okay, so in theory, if, yeah, if this seems improbable to me to be possible, but if New Zealand decided to let no one in or out and they checked every single home, like in theory, it is possible to eventually suppress this provided there isn't a, you know, high school students that are passing along without even realizing they're sick and they're sneaking out of their windows to go hang out with each other. Like these, this is the problem of humans don't adhere to rules, but, but uh, it, in theory, you could actually squash things and then basically hang out in New Zealand the moat and protect yourselves. Uh, it, it's theoretically possible, but just given human behavior I su- and, and, the, and the needs of global economy, I suspect it is unlikely. And would require some extreme measures and, and human compliance. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Jacob, and best of luck. Hopefully we'll check back in with you when you're a little further down the process. That is Jacob Glanville joining us via Skype there to talk about the work that his company is doing in looking for antibodies to help fight COVID-19 and giving us, well, basically a world exclusive there. He's moving to the next step of the process.